All right, welcome to Witch Place Radio. I'm here with a guest who is uh, new to the show and, and relatively new to me as well. It's, it's uh, you know, I try to follow as many local artists as I can on social media, regardless of genre. Whenever I see a new one, I start following. And I have so many on that I've, that I've followed and haven't followed up on actually listening to. So when the guest on this episode reached out to me, I'd heard the name, I was following social media, but I hadn't really done kind of a deep dive in, into the actual music. And I'm glad that you reconnected because, uh, I mean, what you're doing is really cool. It's different. It's pretty unique. Um, and so I think the best way to start this off is if you want to just introduce yourself, uh, give a bit of background about what it is that you do, and we'll take it from there. Sure, yeah. Uh, my name is Chris Sams. I, I make music under the name C. Sams. The C, the C stands for Chris. Um, and uh, I make uh, synth pop music. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, if you've followed me on Instagram before, you might see I, I also sometimes dabble in ambient and that kind of thing anything synthesizer related basically but um yeah definitely uh along the lines of uh synth pop depeche mode new order that kind of stuff okay yeah well and the reason we're, we're here today is to talk about this new record you have coming out but i want to just go back a little bit first how long have you been doing this like what when did you start sort of uh experimenting with synthesizers uh i i guess i started experimenting with synthesizers in the early 2000s i was in a, a band called tiger beat that was the first oh, yeah. time i ever uh uh bought or tried a synthesizer um yeah i think I, you know you know mitch who's in tiger beat as well um that, that's when it started and then uh, I, I would just buy synthesizers with really cool presets and then i realized eventually you could make your own sounds and yeah. it wasn't really about the presets for the most part um so yeah it was probably around 2008 that i started messing with synthesizers and it's become my my main instrument um before that i was playing bass guitar maybe a little bit of drums here and there but um yeah synthesizers really kind of took over everything i did <laughs> they seem to do that actually i've had a lot of people on who do music with synth and it, it definitely seems like one of those things that it becomes a starts as a hobby and then becomes sort of an obsession and people start getting more and more gear and then figuring out how to do more and more things are, are you one of those guys who just like you 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 have sort of grown your collection of, of equipment and tools to make this music yeah there's been uh there have been a few things that have made their ways in and out of out of my setup um it's uh i, I feel like i've gotten to a, a good point now where i've sort of plateaued i mean i i kind of always say that though and <laughs> end up buying some new thing and selling some old thing and um but yeah now right now i have probably about five or so since in my in my setup and um as far as drum machines go i kind of rely on um a sampler to kind of take you know classic 808 909 uh lindrum samples and kind of it's a it's a volca sample and it, it has its own character that it brings to the samples that I, I really like. And yeah, so that's kind of it's kind of where the setup's at now. But yeah, there have been many <laughs> come through. Yeah, yeah. That seems to happen. I think everyone I've met who who is into it, that, that that seems to be a common trait. But what you just said about sort of the the character of the equipment, of the of the samplers, of the of the sounds, um, that's something I'm always interested in with more electronic music, is just the idea of uh having character and feeling and emotion sort of associated with with very very um, sounds that you would assume on the surface are sterile and, and digital and or analog, depending what you're using. But you know what I mean. It's like this kind of uh, machine sounds versus kind of organically played sounds. And I think there is definitely a way to uh, generate as much emotion and feeling uh, out of a synth as you could out of a guitar or a saxophone or whatever. But how do you feel about that? Like, uh, how do you sort of get? feeling out of what you're playing because i think in listening to your stuff that is definitely part of it like there's definitely sort of an emotional sort of path a lot of the songs take yeah i think well for me this whole synth pop genre synthesizers in general uh it's such a nostalgic thing for me it's it's the sounds that i grew up with yeah whether it was a band on the radio or um the soundtrack to some you know, interstitial, commercial, whatever, coming up next, yeah. uh, movie special kind of kind of sound. There was sort of that uh, that nostalgia and and a, a sort of warmth to it because 
even if it was a digital synthesizer, it usually made its way through some analog or some other medium before it made its way to my ears. So sure. I think um, I think that's that's kind of the trick is to make sure uh, even if you're using a, a digital synth emulation just like in your computer, um, having it go through some um, some medium or some kind of morphing mechanism to to give it that little bit of life and little bit of um, variance uh, to break up that sort of cold signal. I think I think that's kind of the key and and um, and something I try to to make sure uh, I, I put in my music as well. Do you think that's a conscious thing that listeners pick up on? I mean, obviously for you, doing it is a conscious thing, but do you think people can hear that? I mean, is, is there like an audible sort of, um, I don't know if there's an answer to this, maybe not, but like, you know what I mean? Is, is there something that sort of is a, a tell maybe that, that that kind of sound has gone through sort of those extra steps uh, to analogify itself, I guess? Yeah, I, uh, I well, yeah, I think um, you can really... It's like it's like cooking. Uh, you can really over season something. Sure. So maybe, maybe you have like a tape tape emulation or something that you're feeding things through, and you know it's really tempting to crank it up so you really feel it and really hear it. Um, but I think uh, we can hear and feel that warmth on a much more subtle subconscious level. Um, there's sort of like a you don't you're not. It's not like you hear the digital sound. And you think, oh, this is too digital. There's almost like a, a, a an ear fatigue to the to the right. the digital. I, I find that super digital sound um, where it's like too perfect, um, or you know maybe that that sound wave is repeating too perfectly too too many times. So basically, what that warm analog um, feel does is it kind of varies it a bit. So it does feel a little more natural and and like a sound that you can listen to for longer periods of time sure. but having listened to a lot of a b tests like the new digital version of like a juno like some old analog synthesizer it is almost impossible these days to hear the difference between the digital and, and the analog right right well and then i mean th there's an extra level to that i guess because you're releasing this stuff on vinyl too right like your, and, and cassette, your, your, your upcoming album and your previous one was an LP as well, right? So, I mean, yeah. does that contribute to it at all? I mean, I, I love tapes personally, but I mean, I know tapes are kind of have a reputation for being a lot more lo-fi and, uh, you know, not necessarily having the the, the same sound quality as a, as a you know, high, high, high res digital file or something. Does that uh, kind of add to the, the sort of feel of it as dropping it down to sort of a cassette level? Absolutely, yeah. And there's all sorts of warbles and, you know, a lot of, I mean, <laughs> I think warmth can be as simple as um, uh, a low pass filter or basically cutting the high frequencies of anything right. suddenly it sounds warm and, and, and nostalgic and tapes definitely do that and I, I almost didn't do tapes for this release but I, I definitely did like I did a run of 10 demo tapes to send out to some uh, record labels okay. and um, and yeah my friend was I was over at a friend's place and he wanted to put my album on for me while we were eating in Pumelo. Shout out to Sid. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I just, I loved the way it sounded. It's, it's, it's my favorite way. It's the, it's my favorite way to listen to the album for sure. Cool. It sounds cool. Awesome. Well, that's interesting too, because of the kind of nostalgic throwback sort of vibe to it as well. Right. I mean, you definitely obviously uh, making references to, to influences from the eighties. And I mean, tape, you know, that was sort of the format, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And actually, um, me knowing anything about synth pop or um, uh, synthesizers or anything like that, uh, I, I felt like I was always kind of chasing that sound and I'd hear something on the radio or I knew like, you know, the sort of cheesy 80s pop hits like, um, like uh, I don't know, like Culture Club or um, I'll even throw in Blue Monday by New Order. Sure. Uh, even though they ended up being one of my favorite bands. Um, it wasn't until I just, I bought a Depeche Mode tape. I worked at uh, uh, a thrift store and I had access to lots of tapes. And I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll try this Depeche Mode tape. I, I've heard people talk about Depeche Mode. And uh, I put that tape on. Uh, I sat in my room and uh, started playing uh, an old Nintendo 
uh, and it was just so nostalgic. And uh, yeah. it's hearing that tape, it, it was like the best of Depeche Mode or something like that. I was like, oh, these are the sounds I've been trying to find and like have more in my life. And um, yeah, it was it was chasing that down on tape uh, that uh, kind of brought me to where I am now. Well, how, how do you get then from, I guess, from the point of, of hearing that and realizing like, you know, light bulb going off, this is the sounds you want to create to then figuring out how to <laughs> actually make those sounds? Because I find that, I mean, even though I've had explained to me, you know, in depth plenty of times, the idea of synthesizers, it's very daunting to me as someone who sees people doing it well. And just there, there seems to be like this whole kind of like uh, almost magic to it, to, to plugging things into a wall and turning knobs and like, how do you get from, oh, I want to do this to then suddenly like you're actually in the process of making those kind of sounds? Yeah, I guess um, you kind of fumbled through it. The way I did it um, was I was still in the phase of, of, of buying synthesizers that had presets that are like, sure. okay, I'm pretty sure it's, there's almost like that that sort of soft horn sound. Uh, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about. I think so, yeah. Wow. Almost like if you think of Africa by Toto, that kind of sound. It was the uh, the Microcorg XL Plus or something that had various dubstep settings that uh, I didn't really need at the time, but um, it had that that really great nostalgic like wow kind of sound, uh, classic synthesizer sound to me at that time. And I just started there, and then um, you know you just start playing with the knobs. You get a little more brave, and you're like, okay, what does this do? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll turn the synth off and turn it back on, and nothing will be broken. And so you know. I'm, I'm just going to turn this and, oh, oh what, what was that? That was resonance. What does that mean? What does that do? And then, and then the more you like, the more you look into other synthesizers, you know, what, what's the best starter synthesizer? I, I can't say enough good things about the Roland SH-101 or they, uh, they reissued it as the O1A and just the layout of that, that synthesizer was so intuitive in, in learning what, what the workflow is to create a sound on a synthesizer okay okay yeah and, and so this, this new record you have coming out it's it's coming out I, I guess next month from when we're recording this but this is your first uh release in in a while right i mean i know you've had the the singles kind of leading up to this but this is your first full length in in how many years now uh five and a half i think uh yeah i think the first album was october 2018 okay yeah and i i wanted to release this one october ish uh, of 2023 but i didn't quite get the records in time so i thought let's wait until till the spring kind of fits the uh the theme of the record anyway did the um i mean how, how long ago did you have this sort of finished i mean did the pandemic pandemic play into this at all or with the time um, of the release or, or is, is that five year period is that just kind of your process of, of making new material yeah, it kind of was the process of making new material. I only ever, when I made that first album and put it out on vinyl, that was kind of like, oh, okay, I did that thing. I, I, I don't have to do it anymore. Well, I you check it off the list, yeah. Again. Yeah, so I'll just continue to jam and um, post random things to, to Instagram. Um, but um, I did this uh, this monthly challenge, I think, three different times. Uh, it's called January. It's for any kind of songwriter, but there are a lot of synthesists that that participate. And uh, you basically write a song for every day uh, for the month of January. Cool. I've kind of accumulated all these started songs. And I started to, I, I was just listening to these one minute clips of them. And I thought, oh, that song could be longer. or right. And then I just started to like pile them together. I was like, okay, I could probably make another album. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess um, I did start recording this album in the pandemic, um, but I, I did finish it. It was finished, finished um, November 2023. Okay. So it's not, it's, it's fairly recent when you had it actually like ready to go. Yeah. 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 Cool. And it's so hard to sit on a project once it's finished because you just, you've been working so hard and all you want is to put it out, out in the world. So even just waiting these, for so months it, it's been it's been tough so i'm excited yeah, I bet, yeah. what uh what's the response been to the single so far because i know you have two of them um at the time we're recording this that are out yeah the response has been great um i've been kind of promoting the music uh 
more than I have in the past. Um, I'm generally kind of like a, I don't, I, I'm, I'm my worst salesman and uh, don't like talking about what I'm doing. Um, but uh, it's been, it's been great putting these singles out and, uh, and actually sending them out to, uh, to some media channels and, and stuff like that. And the response has been great uh, so far. Cool. Uh, and uh, we just played a show um not that long ago a few weeks ago at this point um and uh it was mostly the new songs and, and the response was great people were dancing and, and cool. seemed to be enjoying themselves so that was that was great to see uh for the first time some reaction yeah. to, to some of the new stuff well, i guess that validates the time that you've spent working on this too right is it seeing the the in-person immediate reaction to it yeah absolutely and and it actually is this album i worked harder on probably more than any other music project partly just in in songwriting itself but also uh this was definitely a pandemic thing but i wanted to learn how to mix okay, uh, okay. because on the last the last project i thought um you know i really wanted to get in there i felt like there's still some creative decisions to be made that's kind of like a a hot topic i guess mixing is maybe supposed to be technical but i think there's a lot of opportunity to to um to put in a lot of that sort of that feeling or a certain flavor to the, the sound overall. So yeah, that was uh, a big part of the labor of love for this one as well. Well, I can see that being part of the creative process too. If it's your, it's your project, right? You're, you're, you're making the music, you're writing the songs. It makes sense that that would be an element of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it felt good to do. It was a lot of work. It was a big learning curve, but uh, there was a lot of demystifying to do, but um, yeah, once I realized it's, essentially all volume even when you get into the frequencies and and all that kind of thing it's just how high certain things are in the mix yeah yeah that's cool um so you mentioned a few minutes ago the the you played this stuff live how, how does this work live because i mean you know in listening to it and with synths it often seems like it's something that can be done with someone pressing a few buttons and then sort of sitting back i realize that the creation of it is not that but there's definitely sort of this uh, idea that oh it's just electronic you don't have to do anything what does it look what does it look like and and how similar i guess is the sound of the live show to what's on the record uh yeah that that's that's a really good question um that's uh the answer depending on what year uh the, the answer would have changed um i've done this this project as a solo act with mostly backing track and um the vocals are live obviously but um Maybe I would pick one synthesizer or two synthesizers and remove those parts from the recording and okay. uh, have have that be the case. Um, it's that's not super dissimilar to how it is now. Um, my partner Danielle is is up on stage with me now. She's also featured on the record on uh, on vocals on a cool. couple songs. Um, so it just kind of made sense for her to to join me on stage. We we played a few shows last summer uh as a duo um but now uh my friend steven who is uh sort of my uh my synthesis enthusiast uh friend we we kind of uh figured out synthesizers together he's joined us on stage now too so uh it is now a three-piece uh drums are in the backing track still um but uh yeah i haven't quite made the leap to uh to bringing everything on stage and having the sequencer there and having it all fully live. Um, that would maybe be the, the dream final scenario of the, of yeah. the live experience. But, uh, but yeah, with, with the backing track, um, and having the drums and some of the arpeggiated parts, uh, or the sequence parts, um, along with the, the live main parts going on, uh, it, I think it sounds pretty close to the record um but uh there is a bit more of a human element to it i would say so um it makes it easier to play live but also i think adds adds a nice spin on it yeah are, are you are you sort of aiming to play it as similar as possible to the record or is there room sort of to to to, to change it and maybe show by show even just to, based on having that human element involved yeah i mean the the goal now right now is is to uh to play it as closely to the record as possible, but even as I say that, I'm realizing um, some of the the songs from the previous albums have changed. Um, Danielle is singing backups on on some of the songs where there weren't 
um, human backups before there was maybe vocoder backups, but right. um, so yeah, some things are changing here and there. Some of the, the intros are a little bit different, but I, I would say the goal, I guess, is to try and uh, do the album as much justice as possible. Cool, cool. And so this, you know, the good thing about this being a podcast is someone could hear it the day it comes out, in, in which case your your album is imminent, the release is imminent, or they could hear it, you know, a year from now or whatever. Um, what's the best way to uh, to find your music online? I, I mean, I know you you have the, the two the two releases now, um, but what, yeah, where would you send someone? Do you have a preference uh, where someone would... Uh, First of all, listen, and then secondly, just you know, to buy a physical product because you have the the, the vinyl and the cassette. Yeah, I would say for for buying the physical product, um, definitely Bandcamp. Uh, it's uh, csams.bandcamp.com. Um, it's also a great place to listen to the album. That's where uh, I listen to. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's where I listen to the singles at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say. I, I like to to mention sort of like the uh, the free, completely accessible ones. Uh, I'll, I'll be posting it to um, SoundCloud um, uh, through the distribution thing that I use. It, it all goes to uh, YouTube track by track as well at some okay. point. Um, yeah, those are the best ways, but it'll be available on everything. Uh, Spotify, iTunes, um, yeah, you name it, it should be there. Right on. And what's the actual release date? I mean, uh, for people who are listening ahead of the release date? Yeah, yeah. So the, the album comes out on uh, Friday, May 3rd. Um, and the album release show is uh, the following day, May 4th, on a Saturday at the Handsome Daughter. Right on. Who, who else is playing at that show? Do you have an uh, opening act? We got French Class and uh, DJ Joel F is uh, going to DJ between, between sets. Cool, cool. And then, um, uh, you know, as far as uh, finding out about future shows or future releases and that kind of thing, what's the best way to sort of uh, follow what you're up to, um, whether it's on social media or elsewhere? Yeah, I think it'll probably be uh, Instagram. Um, it's the only thing keeping me on the platform, but it is also the easiest thing for me uh, in terms of keeping people up to date with what I'm doing. Right on, right on, cool.